The fool may think he's a wise man, but the wise man knows what a fool he's been. I'm Paul Falcone. Welcome to the Pro Fools Podcast. There you are. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Sorry, the, 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 sun, the sun shining through the skylights behind me, but I wanted to do a different scene today. A little bit of like heaven and hell with the, the darkness and the light over there. I, I kind of like it. Right? I, I kind of like it. I feel like, uh, you know, I'm uh, heavenly. All right. I'm Paul Falcone. Welcome to the podcast. I am here with Jeff Lanier. How's uh, it going? It's going all right. I'm out here quarantined at the resident studios out here in Long Island. Uh, it's going okay. It's definitely uh, some odd times we're living in. How's things going for you? Where are you at? Pretty good. I'm in the Bronx uh, by Yankee Stadium. What's, so for those people that are listening outside the city, what's the tone of the city right now? Uh, to be perfectly honest, I really don't go outside very much to get much of a clue. Um, I go for a run once a week. Um, I spend some time with my girlfriend who lives outside of the city proper. So that's sort of the only times I ever actually leave my apartment. Yeah. Like my apartment building has, um, I guess like a community garden type area that even that's closed. Yeah. So they don't even, there's even a set of rules for us to go to the laundry room. So it's, it's different. Yeah. We certainly are, are on lockdown. I know when I head into Manhattan, it's like a ghost town compared to what it used to be. I tell everybody it's like 4th of July at nine o'clock in the morning. All the stores are closed. Nobody's on the street. I mean, all the pictures that people post and videos and stuff, it's like, it's ghost town. Yeah. But well, I mean, if, if there's nothing for you to go out and do, then there's not much of a reason to go. Yeah. I mean, it's, it certainly is changing the, the music industry and how we collaborate. I mean, the music industry was pretty online to begin with, uh, but now it sort of forces us all to be completely online. Uh, yeah, almost everything is like a conference call now or or a Zoom meeting or even there's a lot of people who I've actually finally done like face-to-face with that I've emailed with for years that it's like, well, now's a chance to actually do a zoom meeting. You know, and so in certain ways we will learn new ways of working through this. And I think that it's going to carry through now. Uh, I don't think it's ever going back to the way it was. So there are some positive takeaways from it. Like you said, we're finally meeting people face to face that were always just emails and phone calls. Yeah. And I mean, I, I would like to think that there will be some degree of normalcy returned, but I think there's some paradigm shifts that are taking place that might stick. Yeah. Not just for music, but for a number of different businesses. Completely. completely. Like, did you see the thing that's happening with uh, the film industry right now? What thing? Universal and AMC specifically. Just sort of the generally, it looks like they're, Universal is playing with the idea of doing a lot more direct to video on demand releases. So AMC is threatening to not carry any more Universal movie, movie titles in their theaters. So it's, for me, it brings the question of how much longer do we still have movie theaters and their sort of stranglehold on a new release. That industry has been on the edge for a long time. You've seen them make changes with just how movies are delivered with you know things like Dolby Atmos, but now people could put Dolby Atmos in their homes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, industries will be changing. Drive-ins may be coming back. What did you see that Europe is now doing drive-in concerts? Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Well, because drive-in movies are still a possibility with a lot of the theaters now, so why not do concerts the same way? And at that point, then why not just broadcast everybody's car? It just starts to get very weird. I mean, I think broadcasting from like live streaming from home or from rehearsal spaces or all that, that might be something that becomes a growth industry. It, I think it already is. Well, it is for now, but I'm saying even when we return to normal or whatever the new normal will be, maybe that's still become a... A, a, a change in consumer behavior. We're watching the birth of it now, that it is becoming that. So, okay. First, where did you get your start? Wh- where did you come from? When did you figure out that you wanted to work in records for your, in, for your career? So I'm from a small town in Pennsylvania, and I was in a band, like I think a lot of us were growing up, um, doing talent shows and that kind of stuff. And for my high school, we have to do a graduation project in order to graduate. A lot of kids do community service or uh, 
redoing their kitchen and their house. But for me, it was okay. If I have to do a project anyway, I'm going to record an album with my band. And it wasn't just that we recorded the album partially in my drummer's recording studio in his basement, partially in my basement. But then we also did a CD release show. So we had we had CDs made. We printed our own tickets. We rented um, the gymnasium in our town and sold the tickets ourselves, promoted the show ourselves. And it's a small town. So inevitably, some other people saw what we were doing and decided that they were also musicians and that's, they wanted to put out an album for their senior project. So then I ended up recording some senior projects for some other people. I was like, oh, maybe music is the thing. Um, you know, initially, I guess the thought process was the production side of it. I don't think that that's, that's been part of what I do, but I wouldn't say it's been the bulk of what I do. But that's what led me to, okay, music industry in general is something that could be an option. Where can I go for that? What can I do for that? And I was also an athlete in high school. And strangely enough, there was a kid I used to wrestle a lot named Justin Terhoon, who ended up going to Drexel. And I'd never heard of Drexel until I saw that he committed there. Once he did, it became a school that I also looked at because they have a music business program and they had their own record label there. So then I ended up going to Drexel. Um, from Drexel, the one of the heads of the programs was a, an A&R guy who he worked with Columbia uh, named Terry Tompkins, who you know from Hofstra now. Um, he brought in a guest speaker who was the head of A&R for Roadrunner, which was a label that had a lot of artists on it that I'd always grown up appreciating. Uh, he invited, Terry invited me to come sort of audit the class that I wasn't really even a part of when Dave was coming in to speak. And I brought in a CD of bands that I thought Dave should, who is the Roadrunner contact, that uh, a CD of bands that I thought Dave should listen to. And it had my contact information on it. From there, he ended up contacting me I think, a couple weeks later to come to New York for the first time ever for me for an interview for what ended up becoming being like a, a talent scouting consulting type role while I was still at Drexel as a sophomore. And that was sort of, I guess, the first real official type gig. What I love about that story is that you you created your own opportunity. You essentially became a talent scout and showed them that you could do it. And that's how you landed the job. Yeah. I mean, I'd been scouting bands just for the whole finding artists that other people didn't know had been something I'd been doing since even high school. I mean, to me like in high school, I, I was finding bands that were already signed to major labels, but they were lesser known bands. That was sort of my introduction to like, oh, I want to know about bands that my friends don't know about and be the person who introduces them to it. Then once I got to college and learned a little bit more about what that meant, then I could actually try to find bands that uh, the labels didn't know about. And one of my favorite things I used to do was I would send scouting reports and a lot of the responses would be, where the hell did you find this band? For better or worse, I always thought that that was feedback that was positive because you don't necessarily need me to tell you about an artist you that... There's a handful of artists that everyone who does a has has heard about. They're the super buzz band. You really don't need me to point them out to you. I feel like the value for me was in finding stuff that you would never have found without me. Hmm. So did, did you realize that that was the role of an A&R person or do you find that is the role of an A&R person? The, the finding of the artist is definitely a huge chunk of it, but then there's also a lot more to it of, okay, once I have them and they're signed and all that, trying to get the best out of them, the best project out of them, uh, maintaining the relationship well, because there's, depending on what label you're at, there's all sorts of different dynamics as far as um, ownership, structure, and trying to make the best possible release with them. But definitely finding the artist is a huge part of it. And making sure that that artist fits where you are. The, you know, an artist that was super successful on one label might not have been that on another. Which, which brings us to Chesky. Currently, you're the GM and A&R over at Chesky. Uh, so how did you land the gig at Chesky? Um, my second question is, Chesky is a pretty boutique label. Uh, what sets Chesky apart? So I'd been doing... Uh, essentially what were like live audition sessions with some unsigned artists 
as the producer of the sessions, which were essentially, it's like a live audition for unsigned artists that I was also filming and putting out on YouTube. And the premise was if you were a label person, booking agent, whatever industry personnel, I was filming the session in a manner where you felt like you were at the session. So you didn't, I was also inviting some people to come actually watch the sessions in person. But if you weren't able to come down, then you would actually get the impression that you were there based off of how we were doing everything, which was, you know, not a lot of effects and auto tune and all that kind of processing. And you were doing typically one take per song. So you weren't chopping it all up, putting it back together. And when Chesky was looking for a label manager, then there was a sort of a lot of crossover in what they do versus what I do, because what or what I was doing at that point, because what Chesky Records does is minimally mic'd recordings with the goal being giving the the audience the impression that they're in there with the band. So they'll typically do an entire album in one day, um, frequently with just one microphone, not always, but historically with minimal microphones. Um, we've started to play around a little bit more with what that means and how we're doing that in 2020 and beyond. but. Uh, it's been historically minimally mic'd, try to capture the artist in their natural space rather than be something that's been assembled over the course of weeks and months. Um, it's more like a snapshot of what they do. So there was a real synergy there between what you were doing uh, already and what they were doing. Right. It was me understanding like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm, I I. I understand a lot of the trappings that come with or the challenges that come with that type of recording. And then also I'm spending a lot of time finding new artists. And obviously the the artists that I'm trying to find are able to do the thing that I'm trying to do, which fits what you're trying to do. Would you say Chesky has changed or have you had an influence on the way Chesky does business since you've been there? Uh, I mean, you'd like to think that, but... I would say one of the things that's that's changing for whatever reason moving forward is we also have a sub label that's called Coconut Bay, which has existed prior to my arrival, but we haven't really put out anything on Coconut Bay in quite a while. But we have a new uh, single coming out tomorrow and then also a new album coming out this fall from Christian Machado, who many will know as the lead singer of El Nino. And that was done with sort of a hybrid approach. So we we did a recording over the course of two days in a studio in Brooklyn. And we did uh, two microphones on the band, one microphone on the vocal, and then also allowed Christian to do some overdubs in his studio in Los Angeles after the fact. So it's still, from its, from its core, it's minimally mic'd. But it's allowed us to have some freedoms with what we're able to do from overdubs. and layering in some effects that just add a little bit something more to it. So I took a listen to the single today. Uh, first of all, I love it. You know, congratulations on the project. Uh, it, you know, it's really <laughs> exciting. You. So you're telling me that was two mics on the band and one mic on the vocal and it was a live take. So the single that's out now is Die Alone. That was done. That That's one of the few tracks that's completely done in Christian's studio. That's not from... There's nothing from that on the Brooklyn the Brooklyn sessions. I see, I see. The, the bulk of the record was done, two mics on the band and one vocal on Christian. Uh, but there were three songs that he worked on after the fact in his studio in Los Angeles. Die Alone was one of the ones that we got done right before the deadline to finish the record that he did completely on his own in the studio. Got it, got but it. But it fits stylistically with what was done on the rest of the record. I see. Yeah, I really, I really liked it. It's certainly, uh, you know, for those that know Christian, uh, he is from the band Il Nino. It's certainly a departure from Il Nino sound. How did you guys decide on the direction for that? I'd actually reached out to Christian about doing it. Um, there was a story about the possibility of what he was or wasn't going to be doing with El Nino moving forward as of last year. So I contacted him about doing a solo project because I thought, you know, for those who know El Nino, they were a Latin metal band that I actually grew up listening to in my teenage years. And he was on Roadrunner at one point. And I always thought that 
there's enough Latin elements in it that he could just do a straight up Latin record, which is for the most part what we've done an acoustic Latin record with obviously some rock elements to it and just a degree of singer songwriter nature. But I approached him with, have you ever thought about doing something like this? Is this something that you'd be interested in? Do you have any material that already fits for this? And it's something that I guess he'd already had in the back of his mind. So we were able to figure out a way to make it work for everybody. So you reached out to him. That's how the project came about. Yeah. I reached as soon as I saw that. Okay. Well, it looks like there's some, you know, he might not be with them or there's some degree of uncertainty regarding his role with the band. Maybe now is a good time for him to try to delve into something solo. And your role in the project was as A&R or what was your role in the project? So I am a co-producer on the album. So what is, so what's, so what's your day like in running this, in, in working on this project? Well, because I'm, I'm the co-producer on the album, but I'm also still the general manager of the record label. So I'm literally responsible for everything that, that goes on with the label and whether or not I do it directly myself or not. We have to be concerned about getting the best product, you know, as the producer side of things. So making sure that I'm getting the best songs on there, getting the best performance on each song. But then as the label manager, I've got to figure out the marketing structure, who's going to be the publicist on it. Uh, are we pitching to you know, AAA radio or Active Rock radio? Who's working at AAA? It's literally down to like, what are we doing for social media posts? What demographics are we targeting? It's all the things. And to getting them set up as far in advance as we can. That's certainly wearing a lot of hats. Uh, out of all those duties, which one would you say is the most important to the success of the project? I mean, I feel like the project itself is always the most important. So getting the best possible record you can with the artist that as many people care about as humanly possible, because you can have the best marketing plan in the world, but if people don't care about that product, then, you know, I don't know how effective your marketing strategy is going to be, but you want to make sure that every project that you do, you're giving its absolute best opportunity to perform. So when, when you are marketing it, are you marketing it to an existing fan base? Are you marketing it to new fans? How does that process work? Both of those. Cause I feel like if you're a fan of El Nino, then there's stuff in there that you're going to appreciate. Not only there are two previous El Nino songs that have been reimagined with new arrangements, but you enjoyed, you know, Christian's lyrics before his melodic uh, sensibilities. A lot of that's still here. It's not a lot of distorted guitars and heavy drums, and but a lot of the things that you would have enjoyed as an El Nino fan are still there. If you don't know who El Nino is, then there's still Christian's a great songwriter. So there's a lot of that that's that's enjoyable for you as as just a music fan. Uh, everything that every project that I try to bring, I feel like the goal is a cross demographic appeal. I don't want to do things that just appeal to one small group of people. You want to find something that you think can be enjoyable by a large group of people. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely music is, is for the masses. Music is you're trying to get music out there to as many people as possible. So how do you define your goals for the project as an AR and A and R and as a GM and how do you meet those goals? I mean, ultimately it depends where you are. Different labels have different goals. If you're at Republic, what success means to you is different than what success means to, to us or to any other independent label. Um, typically, I'm trying to get as many people as I think are the inherent audience aware that the record exists as possible and that the feedback from those people is positive. Uh, there's so much music being released in 2020 that getting people to pay attention or to make sure that a record gets its fair due attention is very difficult. There's something like 40,000 songs being added to Spotify every day. So getting press to pay attention, I mean, even making sure that fans of the artist are aware that the record is out is difficult because with Facebook, you have to, to put in actual advertising revenue to make sure that everyone who follows you sees all your posts. Hmm. So even making sure that the people who follow your artist are aware that the record's out is not the easiest thing to do anymore. So I feel like for me, that's the the first thing is putting out something that's that's great that people are actually going to enjoy. 
And then second is making sure that the people that I think are going to enjoy it are aware that it exists. Yeah. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Okay. So I got, I got an A&R here on the spot. I got to ask you what I think so many people want to ask an A&R is how do people get their music to you and what makes you excited about something when you hear it? What makes you want to move forward when you hear someone's music? How did, first of all, how does it get pitched to you? Cause I know you sort through a lot of music. Mm-hmm. Well, the first thing I try to tell people is understanding fit. So something can be great and still not be a fit for us whatsoever. And you have to be understanding of that and just be willing to know that that's a thing. Cause, because for example, what Chesky does for the most part is being so live oriented. If your music is very effects oriented or layering oriented or something that you can't really recreate from a live element, it might not be something that ever fits for us. So when I'm looking for something, it's with what I need in mind, not necessarily just, is this good or bad? Um, and from that, everyone that's looking, there's a scene that everyone sort of fits into. So if you're a heavy metal label looking for artists, then you might want to be looking for which artists are playing, which venues are getting played by which stations. Like if you just are trying to progress in your career and you start doing all of the things that you should be doing, if you're starting to succeed, you'll, you will come to our attention. And I know that people don't like that response because it, it feel, you feel like it's taking some of the proactivity out of it, that you can't just email someone and get their attention. You might, and that's something that you can always try to do. But for the most part, people are getting inundated with emails every day. So if you're coming to me from either a booking agent that I've worked with or I know who has a great roster of bands, or if things are already starting to happen for you, that's typically how I start to pay attention to someone. It's because they're playing a venue that I've already, oh, I, I went here and I scouted such and such a band and signed that band. Or you start coming across my attention anyway. It's, it's pretty rare that I'm getting an unsolicited demo and I'm like, oh, this is something that we really need to be paying attention to. Because typically if you're doing all of the things that you should be doing to really be gaining our attention, you don't have the time to be emailing people, hmm. um, if that makes any sense. It, it does. It, it's about, in my opinion, what you're saying is, you know, you'll have that team in place and you'll, you'll see that team being put together and sort of, that's what attracts you to the project is that something is already happening with it. Yeah. I mean, having a team in place definitely helps because then it's, it's when people can lighten my load, that definitely helps. I love when there are managers who, Hey, are we doing are we doing anything with such and such a platform? And I've never even heard of it. Some people might not like that experience. I love that experience because it's, Oh, you know about something I've never heard of. Give me the, give me lay it, lay it out for me. What are, what are we not doing? Cause there's so many things that we're already having to do on every release to even give things a chance that sometimes I'm not, you know, the, the most on top of, Oh, the kids are doing this now. What is this platform? I've never heard of it. Which, what should we be doing? Anytime that there's additional people that can be helping out the process, that's great. So that I don't have to be worried about booking on top of, uh, are we doing promotions with this other company? If I can be focused on selling the record, that definitely helps. It's interesting to me, you talk about different platforms. How much do mm-hmm. social media numbers come into play in your decisions? Well, does that attract you to an artist? If you see some, say someone has 50,000 followers, uh, is that something that draws you to them or it's part of it. And I mean, I'm trying to give advice that sort of is across the spectrum, not just for Chesky because so much of it depends on each individual label and what they do from a marketing standpoint and how much of their revenue is being, how much of their marketing budget rather is being spent on social media advertising. Hmm. If there's a significant amount of advertising that's going into social media, then, then then there's going to be a pretty high importance placed on that. Because if you already have a huge audience to be marketed to, then you're, the likelihood of converting a person who's already following that artist is pretty high as opposed to if I'm targeting people who, okay, well, this person kind of sounds like this person, so I'm going to target the fans of the band that they kind of sound like. I'm hoping that they might be interested. Whereas if this artist already has a huge following, all I've got to do is make sure that those people are aware that the record exists. But for every label that they, they spend to varying degrees on social media. So that really depends. 
Got it. If so, I, I just I'm just thinking here. If someone had a very small social media following, mm-hmm. how does that come into play? Do, would you still cons- give them a shot on the label if there was if they had more in motion, or or is it? I'll let you answer. Well, yeah, I mean, it's never all of one thing. Uh, I like to say that ultimately what I'm looking for is relevancy. So some of that is just what's happening with them. Are they touring? Does press care about them? Do they Are they already getting you know sales or streams or whatever that you're looking at? And then inevitably, what sort of talent do I think is laden there? You know, are they a diamond in the rough that's just waiting for development, which could be possible? Again, depending on each label is looking for different things and how much they're willing to invest into a new artist. But for me, it's never strictly just the numbers because there has to be music there that, like, okay, I see what people are interested in here. I don't even necessarily have to always be falling in love with the artist myself either. It's, okay, I get it. That can be enough for me. It's like, okay, I see that there's an audience here and I understand what they're seeing in it can be enough. Um, But no, you can totally still find an artist that needs development that you believe in. So... What I come across a lot is people that have great music, but they don't have much else going on. And I do try and preach to them that it's not just about great music, that you do have to have, you know, something else going on, which is kind of what you're talking about here. If someone was to hand you great music, but had no touring, no social numbers, uh, no relevancy, how attracted to that type of project are you? I mean, I would say the difference like with what you're saying is it's very rare that people send me something that's great. I will pretty often get something that's good to where it's like, okay, if if you were asking me to poke holes in this, I'd have a somewhat of a hard time without just being pedantic, poking holes in it. But it's pretty rare that I get something that's great. Hmm. Cause when something's great, it's like, okay, we have to figure out how to make this work. And that comes up pretty infrequently. Got it. Got it. All right. So because this is the Pro Fools podcast, mm-hmm. I have to ask you our signature question here. Uh, what is the best mistake you've ever learned from? From a technical standpoint? From any standpoint. You know, I, I feel like I have learned the, the most when, you know, I make you know, sometimes it's a small error, sometimes it's a big error, but, you know, to take away a learning experience from everything good or bad. And, you know, sometimes, you know, if we make a misstep, we learn a lot from that. I, I know a lot of guests have answered about things that happened earlier on in their career, or maybe even in school. And a lot of these guys are talking more about record production standpoints, but I'd love to hear that from an A&R point of view. I mean, I definitely agree. You know, today's wisdom came from yesterday's stupidity. So it's definitely... A lot of the things where you say you say something like, "Oh, you sound so smart," I'm like, well, it's because you know I screwed that up four times before I figured that out how to do it. Um, I would say, I mean, it's, it's tough. Believing the the gut, I would say, is the thing that I've learned. So there are times where you're trying to appease. Sometimes can be where I feel like I then end up backing something that I don't necessarily really believe in that it's like, okay, well it, I'll have less of an issue if I just, okay, sure this works. Whereas if I'm like, okay, no, I genuinely believe in this is what you want to search for. Even if like I've said this before, I don't have to necessarily enjoy it myself, but need to believe in it. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Yes. Yes. You know, it's, it's all about, you know, making records is all about people enjoying the music. It's not just about the music that we like. It's about, you know, music for the masses, uh, at least in the music business side of things. And certainly believing in it and truly believing in it, not just believing in it because everyone else around you does, uh, is really important. Yeah, I mean, there have been times where it's like, okay, can I make this work? And I don't think that that's the right question. Yeah, right on. Well, awesome, Jeff. It's been great talking to you. Uh, Thanks for catching up with me on the podcast. Well, uh, I'd like to do another one of these uh, where we do a roundtable and we play some music and we critique it. 
Would you be interested? Yeah, sure. Let me know. That's awesome. I have some, some A&R friends that would probably be down. Oh, wow. That would be really, really awesome. Uh, we could, we could, maybe we could do a big one where we could get some you know, producer engineers and A&Rs all critiquing at the same time. Yeah, we could, I mean, it'd be interesting. I feel like a lot of my friends would agree with me on things, but you never know. It'd be fun hey, to get into an hey, argument hey. about something. It's, it's, it's always fun to disagree with your friends and have a, and have a healthy disagreement about something. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, though, the people have, that we've become friends with over the years tend to see things the same way. Mm. Well, we'll see. All right, Jeff. But also, before I go, just, yeah. uh, Christian Machado, new single, Die Alone, out now. Check it out. Uh, so, also before you go, so the single comes out, what, what's the date? Friday, May 8th. Right, uh, and then the album, the album comes out September 25th, but it'll also be available for pre-order on May 8th. So we're going to do a band wear campaign where you can get t-shirts, vinyl, all that kind of stuff. Awesome. Can't wait to hear the album. I love the single. Thank you. All right, brother. Take care. All right. Have a good one. Talk soon. The Pro Fools Podcast is brought to you by The Residence Studios. The Residence Studios is a destination studio located in central Long Island, one hour from Manhattan, one hour to the Hamptons. We offer a state-of-the-art recording and mixing studio, photo and video facilities with hotel-like amenities, five minutes from the beach and minutes away from Long Island's major attractions. Contact us at theresidencestudios at gmail.com or Instagram at theresidencestudios. I hope you've enjoyed the Pro Fools podcast as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. There's no one right answer on how to make a great recording. To make great recordings, you must do your best and work your hardest. Don't be afraid to make mistakes, but be sure to quickly get over them and most importantly, learn from them. Because a wise man knows what a fool he's been. Make sure to like, subscribe, and turn on the bell so you can be notified when we post on YouTube. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. You can donate via PayPal at theprofoolspodcast at gmail.com and at theprofoolspodcast at Patreon. Email us, questions and otherwise, at theprofoolspodcast at gmail.com. Check out our website, theprofoolspodcast.com.